Good morning. As we continue with our worship, we will now um, sing songs of praise. First song is Lord, I Need You.
Are we better than unbelievers? No, we're not. Even as we believers, we, we get tired, we get ashamed of the things we do. We're guilty of our mistakes. Some of us are in pain. We're in doubt too. We're hurt and we fear things. But as we believe, as we were baptized, we accept hope, we accept the Holy Spirit, and we let him dwell within us. And now the power of the one living inside of us is greater than the one, is greater than the, what the world could throw at us. Amen? Amen? As we sing our next song, I invite everyone to please stand up. A song we haven't done here before, and it speaks about uh, welcoming the Holy Spirit because it's what our hearts long for. So as we sing this song, if you feel the Holy Spirit and you want to welcome him, I encourage you guys to lift up your hands like this. And don't be shy about the people around you. Don't be shy about the people that are watching this, this stream. 
just, um, I want you to mean in your hearts that you want to welcome the Holy Spirit in here.
him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And so what puts us in good standing with the Father and with Jesus? What, what brings us into fellowship with him? It's the blood of Jesus. You see, none of us are sinless. All of us have sinned. And so in order to come into fellowship with Jesus, we need to have forgiveness of that sin. And, it, and he says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this morning, I want to encourage you to walk in the light and just remain in that fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with each one of us. We are the called out. We are the assembly of Christ. We are the church, the called out ones. He's called us out of the world to walk in the kingdom of light. And so this morning, examine yourselves to see if you are walking in the light. And if you find sin in your heart, repent of that sin. Confess that sin. It says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And verse 2 of chapter 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to cover our sins. That's what that word, fancy word propitiation means. It's a covering. His blood covers our sins. And so we can thank God this morning as we come around the table, as we fellowship with him, and as we, we commune together in the body and the blood of Jesus, we can be thankful that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to cover our sins, and we can be in good standing in the fellowship with him. Let's pray. Father, as we come around your table this morning, we thank you for the way that you worked out our salvation through your son. Thank you for the perfect sacrifice, the sinless sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the body that was beaten and bruised and hung on a cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed that covers our sins. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light and to remain there by remaining under the blood of Jesus. In his name we pray.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, giving us that gift of um, eternal life, that we can uh, be able to be with you one day in heaven, but uh, also to um, know that you're here with us today as well um, through the, the Holy Spirit. Um, help us to understand uh, that, that great gift and understand you uh, better as we um, search the scriptures and um, be with us this morning, be with uh, Justin as he brings forth uh, your word and um, be with the children's church as well. Pray that that'll go uh, wonderful. And uh, thank you for purifying us, Lord, of our sins um, through your, your blood and your son's blood. Um, we just thank you for uh, rescuing us from um, destruction in, in this world. I pray that we can um, be renewed this morning and, and just be able to give you that thanks that uh, you deserve for, um, for giving us life and, and rescuing us from, from sin and destruction as well. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and um, pray for the, the tithes and offerings this morning as we um, bring forth our, our gifts and just pray that we can um, bless you uh, through those and, and um, give back uh, to what you've blessed us with. We, we love you so much and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Just a few announcements. Um, if you received an email with the newsletter, which is out today, or if you picked up the bullet, the newsletter in the back, you may have noticed um, we have some pictures of guys here of deacon candidates. We've been working on this as a leadership team for probably at least a year. We've had a deacon seminar, um, things like that, um, evaluating each one of these five guys and talking to them quite a bit, and um, we'll continue to do so. But um, as of this week, um, these five are coming through as deacons. Um, we'll have a probationary period of six months. We're giving them an option to try it out, see how it works for them, and uh, the option to, hey, this isn't for me. So um, giving them that opportunity, and then once the six months are up, we'll have a or, or, ordain them, um, celebrate what's going on in the church here as well. So a deacon is somebody who serves. So if you need somebody to help you out with different things, Noel, like putting a starter in your car, I don't mind helping, um, but these guys are officially going to be uh, in that spot. So see them for any need you have. Don't be shy um, asking for help. These guys are willing to do whatever it do needs done. And hopefully it's not just limited to these five as well. All of us are called to be servants. Jesus came to serve and be a servant. So, and we're not limiting deacons to just five candidates. Hopefully in the future, um, we'll be adding to these five as well. Other announcements, small groups are ongoing. Um, so if you haven't been a part of those, um, it's not too late to attend any of these meetings that are showing up on the board. Mom's group is meeting this Thursday at Justine's house, so show up there. The Harvest Festival is next Saturday, so if you haven't signed up yet, there's three different ways to do it. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board by the drinking fountain. You can sign up online or talk to Antonio in person. Um, lots of opportunities to help out and be, hopefully we're looking forward and prayerfully we're looking forward to a good turnout for that. We're having a Thanksgiving meal. Um, so there's a planning meeting in two weeks if you're interested in helping out with that. She Reads Truth is an Advent study. Um, if you're interested in doing this study, check with Penny or Leah. 
family of the week this week is David and Leah Sorensen. So check with them, see if they need special prayer for anything. Here's some upcoming events. Um, also check the newsletter and the bulletin. Um, most of these things are mentioned there as well. So check out the newest newsletter. It's out in print and email. And I just said that. So if you have a young person between the ages of two and five, you'd like to go to kids' church, Hannah and a bunch of other people are going to take them now. Thank you. to be gathered in the house of God and it's good to see each and every one of you. We're in the midst of a sermon series that we've titled I'm In and today we're going to be looking at I'm Inhabited. I'm Inhabited. When we think of inhabited we think about something that lives inside of something else. Um, we inhabit the earth because we live here. A hermit crab will find a shell that's been vacated by something and crawl inside and make it home. And a Christian is inhabited. We are inhabited. Inhabited by what? Now, if you change one letter, it's inhibited, right? We're inhibited. No, we're inhabited. We're inhabited by what? Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Christian is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. As we think about the Holy Spirit, we think about being inha inhabited by the Holy Spirit. We, we want to try to understand what that means, and before we can really get into what it means to be inhabited, we need to understand the purpose and origin of the Spirit's work here on earth, with, within the church. And so, Acts is a book of history, it's a, a book of, of the early part of the church, and so turn with me to... Acts chapter 2, and we're going to spend a lot of our time right around here, Acts 1 and 2 today, as we think about being inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse number 1. <coughs> it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a, from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, dwelling in Jerusalem, there were Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished and said, Are they, these not who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we, each one of us, hear in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocked and said they're full of new wine. So, this is, this is obviously a familiar passage of Scripture. We, we know Acts, we've studied Acts. Acts chapter 2 
is, is very familiar to us. There's maybe parts of it that we don't study as much or talk about as much, and, and, but we've, we've read this, we've heard this, and we're, we're kind of familiar with what some of the, the details are. And this particular passage of Scripture is one that creates some confusion within different parts of the religious community as we think about specifically the Holy Spirit. There's different parts of this that's misunderstood. There's different parts of it that's misinterpreted and, and made to say things that maybe it's not saying. And those who don't interpret this passage correctly end up being led astray when they try to start to understand the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, because some people have kind of gotten led astray by and and started to teach things that the Bible really doesn't teach regarding the Holy Spirit. We look at this passage of Scripture, and I think a lot of us focus in on tongues, and that we focus in on the, the Holy Spirit part, um, and the, the, the tongues, speaking in tongues of the Holy Spirit, and we kind of get lost, and we, and we miss maybe the bigger picture of what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. The very first act of the Spirit was to fill the apostles, the twelve. The second act was to get them out into the street and to get them busy, to get them evangelizing, to get them teaching. Now there are some who will say that it was the 120 mentioned in Acts chapter 1 that the tongues of fire appeared on. And this is where some of the confusion starts to come into the religious world. Well, that doesn't follow simple grammar. Because Acts chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now, how do we determine from a linguistic standpoint who the them is. Well, them is a pronoun. Now, there are some people who will say when you go to school that this, you're going to learn stuff that you'll never use the whole rest of your life, right? Well, we're going to have a simple grammar lesson or attempt to have a simple grammar lesson here. Because them is a pronoun. Pronouns are words that really don't have meaning without context. Right? Bill, Bill in, in learning how to study and all of that, talked about context, context, context. Context is so important. Well, there's context that's important just from a simple understanding what you're reading standpoint. Whether you're reading the Bible, whether you're reading a book, whether you're reading a nursery rhyme, sometimes the context from a pronoun standpoint, if you don't have the context, you don't know what the pronoun is referring to. For example, the sentence, she went there, means nothing unless you know who she is and where there is located. She went there. That could mean a whole bunch of different things. We've eliminated half of the population, but there's a lot of locations and there's a lot of females that could be going somewhere. The simplest way to locate a pronoun is to find a word that doesn't make sense without consulting the rest of the sentence or paragraph, and that's why you hear context talked about a lot. And so, I don't even know how to say this word properly, um, antecedent or something like that. Uh, that's the word that the pronoun goes back to. So, if you're in middle school, maybe even before middle school, I, I can't remember exactly when you learned this, you have to diagram this, right? And so, you have to underline a word and then you have to draw back so that you know which one. And it's really annoying at the time you're thinking, why in the world am I learning this? Well, it's so that you'll understand Acts chapter 2. Somewhat. It helps. So, 
Ashley gave me a pen, and then she left. That sentence introduces Ashley, and then uses me, because things like me and I are referring back to the speaker. And so in most cases, the, how do you say it, who, who said antecedent? Antecedent. I, I looked at the, the, the phonetic, and I was, anyway, I tried to figure it out on my own, and it still, it just doesn't sound right. It's a weird word. Why couldn't they make that word to be an easier word to say? But the word, so in most cases, the antecedent will be used a sentence or two before the pronoun and may be repeated alternating with the pronoun for the duration of the piece that you're reading. And so pronouns have to agree with their antecedent in terms of person, quantity, and gender. So consequently, um, as, as I was writing this, researching this, and reading different things about this, I thought, okay, well, we're going to have to change grammar in a few years because listen to this next sentence that I didn't write, but it's referring to grammar. It can never refer to a person. And so in our gender dysphoria that we've got going on right now, that may change. He can never refer to a woman, and those can never refer to a single item. That used to be truth, absolute truth, but now even that's being called into question in some people's minds. But anyway, it's still true. Um, so we have here in Acts 1 through 3, we have they, they, them, and them. And we have no idea who that's referring to from those passages of Scripture, from just those verses. In order to be able to figure out who they and them is, we have to look at the context. Now, in the original, when this was written, you didn't have chapter breaks and verses and all that. That was something that was added later for, for clarity and readability purposes. You have to go back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 26, where it says, They cast lots for them, and the lots, there's them again, um, lots fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The them and they in 1 through 3 of chapter 2 is referring back to here, to 26, to the eleven, which with Matthias would be twelve. Now, that's important for a couple of different reasons. There are those within the, the charismatic or the Pentecostal movement who will use this passage of Scripture to say that they refers to the 120 in chapter 1 in verse number 15. But when you start to compare that to a broader understanding of Scripture, it doesn't make sense. And it breaks down when you start to look at other passages of Scripture regarding the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. For instance, in Acts chapter 8, Simon is a magician who believes and becomes a Christian, and he spends some time with Philip, and he starts watching this whole Holy Spirit thing, and it says in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 18 that Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and so he offered them money. This is referring to the supernatural gifts, the gifts of healing, the gifts of tongues, the gifts of of prophecy and all of that, um, seven or eight things that we have there. And so this would lead us to understand that the Holy Spirit and the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit was narrower rather than broad in distribution. So if you go back to Acts chapter 2 and you continue in the context, it appears that the author clarifies for us more to say that the they and the them is referring to the apostles because he says in verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and addressed them and begins the Pentecostal message. He doesn't say that Peter, who is a part of the they and the them, stands up with the 120. He says he stands up with the eleven. So, So the very first act of the Spirit 
was to fill the twelve, and the second act was to get them out into the street and to evangelize. When we start to think about the Holy Spirit, when we, number one, there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of just ignorance about the Holy Spirit. Um, there's a lot of people that they know that we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift, but um, and we we talked about this a few well it's, it's been a while back now I guess when we when we talked about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being a person not a thing um, you know Holy Spirit's not an it um, the Holy Spirit's a being the Holy Spirit's alive the Holy Spirit has feelings and we talked about that um, a few months ago now but too often we want the Holy Spirit to fill us to solve a problem to bring about some kind of emotion, some kind of sensation, to be something personal for us. Part of the draw, part of the allure of the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, is the fact that it's sensationalistic. The fact that you, you get this feeling, that you, you experience this. Whether, whether it's the speaking in tongues, whether it's a healing, whether it's a, you know, a, uh, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, this experience where you know, they describe tingling and they describe all of this different stuff. Jesus said to the twelve, to the disciples, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, what's the power for? What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? We, we, we hear talk about we're going to receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to come, but why? We need to understand the origin. We need to understand the purpose. We need to understand the role. He's already told them, let's go to John, let's look at what he says here in John chapter 16. This is nearing the end of his life here in John. This is um, before he goes into prayer and starts to pray for the disciples and pray for the ones that are to come. John 16 and verse number 7 Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. The Helper is referring to the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see here in a minute. But if I go, I will send Him to you, and when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in Me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but cannot, you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, and He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. Therefore I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. Now there's a lot of different ways that we can go with this, but what I'm wanting us to understand is Jesus told the disciples before Pentecost, before he died, he told them, I'm sending you a helper. I'm sending you. When I go away, I will send the helper. So this can't happen until I leave. It's better for me to leave so that the helper can come. So then we get into Acts. And in Acts 1, before he ascended, he tells them, go to Jerusalem and wait. Go, wait. And in chapter 2, it's the result of their waiting. That's when the Holy Spirit shows up. That's when the Holy Spirit comes, as Jesus said, with power. And the power will come upon you. So, in the context of Acts 1 and 2, we want to notice three things that the power of being inhabited did for them 
and will do for us as well. The Holy Spirit was given, the Holy Spirit was sent, the Holy Spirit came to indwell, and it did different things for them, and it's going to do things for us as well. Number one, the Holy Spirit will help them to share the good news. It's clear that the Holy Spirit was critical to the beginning of the church, to the foundation, to the, to the, the church getting off the ground and getting going. If you back up in Scripture to Matthew chapter 28, we're familiar with this passage of Scripture. We call this passage of Scripture the Great Commission. This is where Jesus, in fact, if you've got headlines in your Bible, it probably says right above verse 18, the Great Commission. Because Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He just, the passage we just looked at, he said the same thing. He's going to speak, not of his own authority, but whatever the Father has, I have, and I will give to you. And he will take my words and he'll declare them to you. So it's all about authority and delivering that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In Acts 2, we start to see this commission fulfilled. They start to do it. All authority has been given. So, when they're together in this room and the Holy Spirit comes with power, it says there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and then these things that looked like tongues of fire came and rested upon them. Now, was it a mighty rushing wind? I don't know. It says it was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Is it possible to have the sound and not have the effect? It's very possible. It says it's like tongues of fire. Was it hot? I don't know. What's a tongue of fire look like? <laughs> I mean, who's seen a tongue of fire besides Sunday school class where they cut one out and... <laughs> I mean, it's describing something that I don't know that you can say emphatically other than the description. Was it like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego where they were in the fire but they didn't smell like fire? Was it tongues of fire that you could light a candle but it wasn't going to burn the one who was resting over them? I don't know. The Bible doesn't really tell us that. Did it blow all the books and stuff off and, you know, wrestle all the pages and they had to, because a wind came through, it just says it sounded like a rushing wind. So, Jesus said there was going to be power come. They're going to have the Holy Spirit come with power. It's going to help them. It's going to lead them into all truth. It's going to guide them. It's going to do these different things. He gives them the commission to go into all the world and make disciples, in Acts 2, we start to see that taking place because there's all of these people gathered, and then on verse 14 there, it says, Peter stood up with the eleven and he starts to preach, and he starts to preach this gospel message. And at the end of the gospel message, we know what happens. The Bible says 3,000 people responded. Here's the question. Did they have a tingling sensation when this happened? Did they have some kind of a sensationalistic reaction to the mighty rushing, the sound like a mighty rushing wind and the tongues that looked like tongues of fire coming to rest upon them? I don't know. It could have been a pretty chilling, tingly experience. It also could not have been. I don't know that it had to be some sensationalistic thing. It just happened.
But the power that they received from the Holy Spirit enabled them to go out and to share. To share the gospel, to share the good news. Peter stood up and began to teach. We already read there where there was all of these different people, all of these different places, and it says they were astonished because they were all hearing in their own language. Now, we may not have the same kind of a situation where we're going to have a room full of people with a whole bunch of different languages and dialects, and we want to speak, and I always kind of thought that they were speaking one time, but everybody else was hearing kind of in their own. The Bible doesn't actually say that. That's just kind of my own interpretation. It It could have been kind of like an interpreter where Paul's, Paul, Peter's talking and then the other ones are, I don't know. Um, It kind of leads you to think that they're saying it once because they're talking about, you know, they've had too much wine, they're drunk and all that. So what they were hearing may not match up, you know, like a bad Chinese movie where, you know, it's recorded in English and, you know, it just, it doesn't match. Maybe that's what was happening. But have you ever went to do something, went to talk to somebody, went to teach somebody, and things pop into your head to say to them that you didn't really study? You didn't really have it written down to talk to them about that, but when they get done, or when you get done, they say, I really needed to hear that today? Is that really any more or less magical or sensationalistic than speaking another language to that person who needed to hear that? Maybe... We just need the boldness to speak up and say something to somebody. There's people who need to hear the good news, and we don't have the courage to do it. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the courage to do that. Peter seems to be, by all accounts, a pretty brash guy. He seems to be the kind of guy who... If nobody else is going to do it, he's going to jump out and do it, right? But what happened when Jesus was arrested and they're on the way to this corrupt trial? Here's Peter, brash Peter, jump out of the boat, Peter. I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to go alone. They're going to have to kill me before they kill you, Peter. Weren't you, weren't you with him? I don't know what you're talking about. No, you, you sound like a Galilean. I'm, I'm pretty sure you were with them. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? So Peter may have been brash, but was Peter bold? Not all the time. There was times he needed help. And so do we. He gave them, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to share the good news. It gave them power to be able to preach. This guy who denied Christ at least three times is now boldly preaching in front of thousands. Acts chapter 2 says that about 3,000 responded to his message. Now, Peter had never been to a homiletic or expository preaching class, but he was getting the truth out, and people were coming to repentance. I've never seen a preacher have a 100% response rate. I'm sure it's, it's, it's probably out there, but 
for 3,000 people to respond and to be baptized, there had to be at least 3,000 people there. That's for a 100% response rate. If it was a 50% response rate, then that means there was at least 6,000 people, and then you can start to do the math and go down. This bold Peter, who denied Christ, was standing up in front of a large crowd of people and preaching a message that was not popular. <laughs> you guys crucified this man. In order to stand up for truth, we need power and we need strength. And sometimes we don't have that on our own. Most times we don't have that on our own. And the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do that. That's all Peter was doing was standing up and speaking truth. Standing up for what's right, standing up for Jesus, and telling the truth of what Jesus did. Now he went back and he gave a little bit of detail and he said, yes, you know, there's going to be a prophecy and there's a lot of other things that have to do with Pentecost and some of their traditions with David, and so he's bringing David into it and talking about Joel, and Joel prophesied that you're going to see, and he's saying this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. So yes, he had a little bit of knowledge, but how much of that did he, did he know ahead of time? How much of that was the Holy Spirit? I can't tell you all of the answers to that, but I can tell you God will give you the power to, to speak, to teach, to learn, to be used. And there's times when standing up for the truth is not going to be the popular thing. There's going to be times when standing up for the truth is going to put you at odds with other people, and it's going to make you even more so want to pull back. Some people, when they hear the truth, are going to be happy and embrace that. Some people, when they hear the truth, are not. And they're going to fight it. John Wesley famous old preacher, asked two of his preacher boys when they got back from a preaching opportunity, he said, did anyone get saved? And if they answered no, he said, did anybody get mad? And if they answered no to that too, then he said, go home, you weren't, you weren't effective. Because if you're effective, somebody's either going to get saved or they're going to get mad. John Wesley believed that true preaching would never leave somebody apathetic. Paul said in Titus chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Even today, the power of the gospel is not in the one who presents it. The power of the gospel is in what Jesus did and what it does in our lives. The last thing that we notice is that the Holy Spirit brought power for unity. In Acts 2, it says that there was people from all over, yet they understood the message. The same message. In verses 7 and 8, it says, They were amazed and astonished and saying, Are these not, um, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And it's the same way today. We may not be able to agree, agree on every little detail. But we should be able to agree that Jesus is the way. We should be able to agree that this is God's word and this has ultimate authority. The Holy Spirit working in our lives should cause us to be able to work together, to be able to be united, to be able to, to, to love each other. The band can come. 
we should be able to agree that if your sins are not under the blood of Jesus, you're not forgiven and on your way to heaven based upon what the Scriptures teach. We should be able to agree that Jesus is coming again. We should be able to agree that Jesus died to redeem the church and we're His bride. We should be able to agree that without Jesus, we're nothing. We should be able to agree that each one of us need Him. We need Jesus, we need God, we need the Holy Spirit inhabiting us. We need the power that comes, the power that helps us to share the good news, the power that helps us to teach and to preach, the power that unifies us and draws us together. If we're Christians this morning, if we've been baptized into Christ, we've read the passage that says well, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You, you are indwelling the Holy Spirit. He set up residence with you. Moved in. Are you taking advantage of that power? Are you embracing that power? God wants to do amazing things in this world. There are, there are people in, in this area, in Elmira, Horseheads, Shimon County, that are not saved. That God wants, to, God wants to reach with the gospel. It's going to take power in order to do that. We need the Holy Spirit working in order to teach truth in order to have boldness to, 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 say, to, to speak forth, to invite, to talk to people. There's things that are happening in your life and in my life that we need boldness in order to stand up for truth. We can be thankful that God gives us the Holy Spirit to inhabit us. I don't know where you are this morning, but maybe you doubt that power. Maybe you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to have free reign. Maybe you haven't invited the Holy Spirit into every aspect of your life. Maybe you want Him to, to, to be working, you want God to come in and to, to save you from your sins, but you don't want Him to, to lead and guide and direct you. I want to encourage you to invite Him into every aspect. Invite Him into your relationships. Invite Him into your money. Invite Him into your um, sleep and your exercise. Invite Him into your playtime every time all day. The song that we're going to sing says, Lord, we need you. We need you to inhabit us. That doesn't mean just on one day. That means all the time. Everywhere I go, every moment of the day, we need you. Let's all stand as we pray. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to, to love us, to help us, to empower us, to guide us. Thank you for saving us, and thank you for giving us an avenue to be saved. Help us to embrace the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Lord, I...